Florida, 500 AD. Colonies of native people thrive in several tribes throughout a peninsula in the vast North American continent. In the center, the people speak their own language, the language of the Tumukau, a Native American colony with a population of 200,000 individuals, a colony that lives a different style of life. Ten individual Tumukans exist per square mile of this range. They have plenty of space to live in harmony with the land, never taking more than the earth can replenish. There are 35 chiefdoms, individual colonies that each speak the same language. They whittle longbows from trees for two purposes, to hunt and for war. The young Tumukau boys equip themselves with war on their minds. In order to be considered a man, the boys must perform well in a war against a rival tribe. The Tumukau rarely fight for territorial gain. It's usually to right or wrong, and sometimes for hunting rights. These boys leave their birthplace for the first time and head out with the adults to war. When the battle wages, these tribes don't massacre each other. They simply battle to prove dominance, usually only resulting in a few deaths, but proving they had the upper hand, then sometimes they will find the love of their life. They take the woman back to the tribe, but not until they ask the chief of the rivaling tribe for the rights to bond with this woman for life. Okay, I made that up but it just seemed like it was the right thing. I mean, what do we really know about 1500 years ago? The Indians walked silently through thick, overgrown forest approaching the rival village. They strategically maneuver in order to have the upper hand. A battle cry is sounded. The war goes on. The rival village is battered and beaten. Both sides have experienced losses. The boy returns with his tribe back to his home. He fought as hard as he could. They arrive back to their village. The word spreads about the battle. The young boy gets his name, Eagle Claw, and then in a ceremonial fashion, he gets his first tattoo. Okay, I made that up too. I made that part up. But just the name Eagle Claw. The rest is true. 2021 AD. People still refer to them as primitive hunter-gatherers, never having developed a wheel. Yet these people had one of the most efficient means of transportation there is. These people left traces of a sophisticated society even more democratic than the one we have today. And artifacts remain buried in the soil that have withstand the test of time. There is no doubt that the Native Americans have influenced modern society. Having successfully creating corn from the wild teosinte grass, creating flour much better than the white man's flour from Zamia, developing hundreds of varieties of potatoes, some that are cold tolerant enough to allow Indians to colonize at some of the highest altitudes. In the southernmost parts of the wild bison territory existed one branch of the Timucan tribes, known as the Cades Pond people. While today much of their history is lost, we are all familiar with the name that means wild or untamed people, Seminoles. 1500 years later, the basics are still the same, yet so much has changed. A storm is coming in and I've got to bring down this $500,000 crane out of the sky because it's the tallest thing and makes a perfect lightning rod. I get a call on my phone in my pocket. Crane jobs put on hold, weather is not permitting. I'm going to make a run to Bass Pro Shops, looking for a present to get my dad. I'm looking for a lure, something that will help us catch a redfish. For me and my family, fishing is more of a tradition. There's a whole different kind of enjoyment by growing and catching your own food. Something nowadays the majority of people have lost a connection to. While I'm at Bass Pro Shops, I remember just a few years before being in the exact same spot digging for Indian artifacts. I get a beautiful shining lure that sure did attract the buyer. Whether it'll catch a redfish, I have no idea. I head home and tend to the ecosystem I'm building. My cat turns on the faucet thinking she understands where water comes from, not realizing that it's pumped from 50 feet below ground level fresh out of the aquifer, pumped up by an electric submersible pump through pipes winding through soil, up the faucet, she's unaware that one event could change everything and it's back to the wilderness from which we came. For Florida, one thing has sure seemed to stay the same, and that's change. Just a few million years ago, Florida wasn't like it is today. This area was actually a coral reef, inhabited by some animals that we may recognize, like the parrotfish that crushed and ate the corals, digesting bits of their symbiotic bodies, part plant and single-celled algae, and part animal. The parrotfish cracking the skeletons of these creatures and expelling the bits later to become the beaches we know today, giving our home the raw material it needed to form a peninsula we know as Florida. Basically a sandbar built by the ocean currents, this is what the fossilized beak of a parrotfish looks like. 
I've been to the Florida Museum of Natural History several times and I don't recall seeing a fossilized giant parrotfish beak like this. This may be the only one I've ever seen. Some sort of giant extinct parrotfish. Just another piece of the puzzle of unlocking Florida's past. The Indians knew this fact. They found evidences of this everywhere. It's in the rocks, the same rocks they created stone tools with. And the Indians found the fossils that can be found throughout the creeks here in Florida. We actually found one such fossil. It's something. It looked like some sort of tooth or something. Dang. Yeah. Wash it off. Dang, there's a hole in it. Must be a pendant or something ceremonial. But while this is amazing, it pales in comparison to the Indian artifact we found that is now on display in a museum. The world is full of treasures. Some treasures are tangible, you can hold them in your hand. Some treasures are memorable, you keep them in your mind and you tell stories about them. I will tell a story about how a group of friends found an ancient Indian artifact that is now on display in a museum. Summer, 1992. We're building a birdhouse. I'm beginning to learn more about nature. We constructed a birdhouse that will hang on a tree eventually. We had extra wood laying around because of the addition we built so my grandpa could stay with us. We placed the birdhouse on the tree. My father explains how birds need a place to stay just like we do. They live in little houses, kind of like the one we live in, minus the luxury. No electricity, no running water, no refrigerator to get their next meal from. Then we went over to the area that Dad had been putting yard rakings under some trees. What are we digging for, Dad? Worms. We need worms so tomorrow when we go fishing we'll have bait. Fish like worms, just like baby birds. We plunged the pitchfork down into the composted pile, and Wigglers slicked downward trying to escape the air. We grabbed them and we dug deeper into the compost pile. A garter snake slithered away as my father explained, See that snake? It's harmless. That's a garter snake. It's here looking for frogs and toads. But son, if you see a snake, it's best you just let the snake be. Some have the potential to cause harm. I looked at him and he said, There's venomous ones out here. The cup getting full of worms. I'm fascinated by the snake and how unique it is. I asked how will I know if a snake is a bad one? For the first time realizing that unlike the worms I'm pulling out all being the same and harmless, there's different kinds of snakes. He said, leave them all alone until you're able to identify them. With the cup of worms now full, we went back and admired the birdhouse we placed on a tall pine tree. Dad said, that looks like a great place for a birdhouse. Pressure now down to 974 millibars. The Saturday, 6 a.m. The smell of two-stroke engines firing at daybreak. We're heading off into Noonan's Lake. We're going to see if we can catch some bass. My father was really into this. So much he didn't let anything stop him. And I'm just around for new life experiences. I didn't realize he's building a foundation of life experience. I will grow up to appreciate. We cast our poles into the murky water. And we're catching fish. A big splash, something tags Dad's spinnerbait, jerking the pole and his arms downward. It makes a quick release. He reels the spinnerbait back in. There's a metal spoon attached to this spinnerbait, the metal spoon now bearing teeth marks of some predatory animal. My dad says, son, that's a gator. We best keep our eyes peeled. Last thing we want to do is come up on a mother alligator's nest. The mother will defend their eggs from anything. She sees a threat. Dad's cleaning the fish and I'm recapping my day. Realizing that birds, fish, and gators share similar prey. Three weeks had passed since our fishing trip, and I consistently saw a small brown bird nesting in the little birdhouse Dad and I created. I learned how mother birds will build a nest inside of their home, just like the bed we sleep on. Still amazed that birds lay eggs just like snakes and alligators, seeing similarities in such different animals. As loud as anything and as frightening as anything you've ever heard, and then it's going to be gone, and it's going to be gone in about the same time frame of about six hours till uh, it's essentially over. And, and I expect that by mid-afternoon tomorrow, we'll have sunshine. We may have sunshine by early afternoon. Sunday at 3 a.m., Florida's being hit by the most catastrophic hurricane ever recorded, Hurricane Andrew. Winds pummeled down on Homestead, destroying the whole city. The storm moves northward, tearing down light poles, trees, and knocking lights out as it moves up towards Gainesville. The wind's getting worse, Trees were swaying and limbs snapping like twigs. The trees in our yard putting up a fight, reaching their maximum resistance. 
These trees have never felt a force like this. Many trees start to reach their breaking point. Leaves and limbs scatter as winds and rain pelt the house. Monday, 7 a.m. I'm woken by the extreme sound permeating throughout the whole house, sounding like the whistles and tatter of raindrops hitting our windows sideways. The lights are out and my mom digs through the dark finding candles, then she lights them. She says it will be like camping, something I've experienced once before. Limbs from the tall pine tree in our front yard snapped off, knocking our birdhouse to the ground. I won't lie, I'm a little scared. Is my house just as susceptible as that bird's house we built? It didn't take long for me to realize the bird's nest was certainly damaged. I'm sure the mother bird evacuated the nest. The eggs inside rendered unsalvageable. No lights. It's back to the wilderness from which we came. Poland, September 1939. Three brothers fighting in the Polish army against an invader. Germany now under the control of a tyrannical dictator. The three brothers are strong. One brother bearing a scar across his head from a sword as these grown men fought in the Polish cavalry. They were part of the Russian Revolution and fought through World War I. As Germany's army moved into Poland, the Polish men defending their best with what outmatched equipment they had. They fought for 30 days until finally all strongholds were overcome. One of the brothers, Arthur, a medical doctor and army captain born in 1898, is being held captive as a prisoner of war. The men starving and bearing the weight of the Holocaust. As Germany was killing millions of Jews in 1945, six years later, the three of them would be freed from the shackles of a war-ridden Europe. What was the Holocaust even like? Well, I'll tell you. The prisoners of Auschwitz received three meals per day. In the morning, they received only a half a liter of boiled water with grain-based coffee substitute or an herbal brew, unsweetened. At noon, a liter of soup containing potatoes, rutabaga, and small amounts of rye flour. The soup is unappetizing, and most new arrivals to the prison are unable to eat it, or only do so in necessity, out of disgust. Supper is black bread, served with 25 grams of sausage, margarine or a tablespoon of marmalade or cheese. One of these items, not all. The black bread is supposed to also cover the caloric needs for the following morning. If you stick to a diet like this, this is what will happen. The combination of insufficient nutrition with hard labor contributed to destruction of the human body, which gradually used up its stores of fat, muscle mass, and tissues of internal organs. This led to emaciation and starvation sickness the cause of a significant number of deaths in the camp. A prisoner suffering from starvation sickness was referred to as muscle men and could easily fall victim in selection for gas chambers. <sighs> my voice trembles as I read this, knowing the events that took place in Europe affected my family so greatly. So this is a modern day uh, great white shark tooth. You can see it's still white, it's fresh, it's a modern day great white. Since those early years, I tried to unlock what makes Florida tick. I made a few good friends along the way. I've dug up fossils from the past, seeing evidence of giant sea creatures that no longer exist. This is an extinct mako. And I'll set that next to... Giant mako sharks that would have no problem taking down today's great whites. I have the teeth to prove it not in a lockdown sealed container and then of course this is a pretty young megalodon you know just for another size comparison it's right around the same size as that giant stink makeup but they just get so much larger than that that's a smaller you know it's a medium sized and meg giant megalodons that certainly ruled our oceans in the time of their the existence comparison. I mean, the teeth on these sharks make the teeth of those giant extinct makos look like prey items. And to think that those same giant sharks were feeding on animals like the giant parrotfish I told you about. I mean, it literally would take an animal like that to do it. I wanted everything that I seen good in other people, you know, families and property and all the things that we strive for, you know, our goals, our lifelong missions and for me I've developed some pretty unique lifelong passions. I will say that money is really not much of a problem anymore. I never anticipated things being as good as they actually are. But I will also say that things weren't always this way. We took some pretty big risks and I will say that Native American culture is something that was taught to us at an early age. Here's us in our living room chilling in our teepee. We love the movie The Indian in the Cupboard, 
White Fang, Pocahontas. We spent Sacagaweas at the store. But never after spending the first 18 years of my life still fascinated by the things that lived and still live around us, had I even considered what life was like for the people who actually depended on the land to sustain them. This is something that most of us have lost a connection to. Labor Day weekend, 2005. I'm 19. Me and a buddy are heading out in a canoe, off to explore an island about a mile off of Cedar Key. I've been to Cedar Key dozens of times with my father. We circumnavigated many of the islands, fishing different tides, looking for reds, North Key, Snake Key, Seahorse Key. I want to go to the largest key, Ostena Odi Key. This is where the Cedar Key Wildlife Refuge is. We only went fishing. That's what my dad's really into. Goes way back for him. I'd always stared at that island from a distance. So now was the perfect time to go to the island in our canoe with the sole purpose of exploring the island and maybe find a little fishing once we got there. And in the process, I never expected what was to come. We're heading out of the harbor, leaving the calm waters of the harbor into the open ocean. We get out about 500 yards offshore, but not even close to halfway to the island. The waves start rocking the canoe bad. I tell Dan, lean into the waves to help stabilize our canoe. All the while, the waves pushing our canoe broadside. Literally, the next wave hits us broadside, and the force of our bodies leaning push the canoe straight under the water. We've fallen out of the canoe and we're now afloat. All our gear drifting out to sea or sinking immediately. Fishing poles, tackle box disappearing as the waves rock us and the submerged canoe. The canoe is only floating around the rim. We're both neck deep in the ocean. Dan said I gotta find my dad's new pole. He just got that thing. I'm a good swimmer. Actually, quite the athlete. I played football, received a few scholarship offers. I made it to regionals, throwing shot put and discus in my first year competing. I lifted weights for four years straight hardly ever missing a day and was one of only two people at my school that made it to the state championships for weightlifting. Let's just say I swim or sink. Dan, I'm going to go down and see how deep it is. I go under trying to reach the bottom in the brown murky water, blue jeans, shirt, work boots for exploring the island, fighting back, adding resistance every kick as I swim downward. I'm not sure how deep it is. My ears start hurting, the pressure of at least 15 feet of water pushing on my eardrums. I get a push in my thigh. Underwater and never reaching the bottom, I flail to the surface. I say, Dan, were you trying to go down too? He said no. Something hit me. It wasn't you, dude. I can't get your dad's poles spitting water out with the words. We see a fin cutting through the water. Kind of panicked. I never felt vulnerable as I do in this moment. My blue jeans acting like buffers for my every kick. I say, Dan, your dad's pull is lost. Let's try to get this canoe back to shore before something really kills us here. We look to shore and see a crowd of people forming on the docks, pointing at us. I guess we're quite the spectacle, Dan. We're steadily kicking, but I don't even think we have control of the direction we're heading. The dolphin breaches. It's in this moment of relief the dolphin clearly showing us that he was there. The dolphin must have been excited. It wanted us to know he was there. I felt a sense of relief that dolphin could have done so many things, but it was just there. I'm feeling like that dolphin's my friend now and relieved it's not a shark that bumped me down below. Finally, a small boat heading our direction. The people see us. They had heard from the people on the dock we were capsized. They pull right alongside us. They throw us a line and say, go ahead and tie your canoe off. We tied that and the cooler together. We load on to the boat and we're heading back to shore. They really cut our adventure short, but I didn't realize just how memorable this moment would be several years later. Back to the harbor, we're greeted by a warden. Y'all boys okay? Yes, sir. Y'all boys have a form of ID? You mind if I check the cooler? We check our pockets, realizing our dry bag's gone. It was just a Ziploc bag. We're protecting our belongings from splashes. Never imagined what was to happen. We lost them, sir. They were in a Ziploc. He checks the cooler. We remembered the beer in the cooler. 
He asks, what's your name? I'm Alex Dobosevich. Dan replies, I'm Dan Shank. Well, how old are y'all? I'm 19, sir. Dan says, I'm 29. The warden walks to his vehicle. I look at Dan and say, 29? He whispers, there's beer in the cooler. What was I supposed to do? I shake my head and look down, realizing the guy has our names. He'll probably just look us up in his system. Realizing now that everything just has to play out. Well, if everything's okay with you two, it looks like you boys have had it bad enough. I'll let you be now. The island hopper's boat and the warden's radio is chiming. Mayday, mayday, mayday. My vessel is taking on water. Warden replies, where's the vessel's location? A mile north of Marker 1. Dan and I looked at each other. We asked if we could go help. The island hopper said, load up. We might need the muscle. We headed out. We made some small talk with the captain. Told him what happened to us. Also, told us that today was a small craft advisory. We had no idea. A phone was used to make a phone call. That's it. Plus, we don't bring him around too much. We just wanted to help someone else for a change. A small boat with a big motor, ass in sinking. We threw a line and the Warren's boat pulled hard, but the boat just slowly tugged along. The newspaper got wind of the story, but I didn't know it till a decade later when I randomly found it. The day after Hurricane Andrew, power's still out. We go outside, limbs broken and snapped, some still hanging. Trees are leaning. The roads are covered with leaves. It looks like nobody's taking care of this place. But people were out and wandering their yards. I go behind the birdhouse lying on its side. The same birdhouse Dad and I created just a few weeks before. I look inside and I see a shiny sheen. The sheen moves. I yell, Dad, Dad, come here. There's something in our birdhouse. My dad hurries over. I mean, I'm five. I'm always getting into things I shouldn't be. My dad inspects the birdhouse. Then he pulls it out. A two and a half foot long rat snake with two lumps in it. My dad then explains what happened here. Son, those lumps are the bird's eggs. I'm in shock. Son, this is the circle of life. Everything has to reproduce and everything has to eat. Things will balance themselves out. Can we keep them, Dad? Well, I do have that old fish tank. Sure, we'll keep them for a while. This was my pet, my snake. I was so proud. My brother got to do everything. I got my water wings on and I'm just learning how to swim. Oh, and here's my brother wrestling an alligator. Oh, and here's my brother slamming a T-Rex. Here's him in front of an orangutan riding an elephant. I mean, heck, he even rode Shamu. I'm certain they still do this at SeaWorld. This was my snake. I was fascinated by snakes, and I learned all I could about them. From my first house, or that point, we moved every two years, sometimes twice in a single year. This gave me an opportunity to thoroughly explore many different parts of Gainesville. I mapped out so many creeks, me and a good friend of mine, a lifelong friend that I've known since I was in second grade. Come to find out, there aren't too many people like that in our lives. We would thoroughly travel these creeks and search for shark teeth and fossils. Shark teeth are cool, but there's nothing like the reaction you get when you show your parents or your friends the shark teeth that you actually found with your own two eyes right here inland. This was way before digital cameras. We would actually look for reptiles and amphibians, and the only proof was if we brought one home to show everybody. Everybody got to experience all of the animals we captured. I'm in fourth grade now. We live by Rattlesnake Creek, a creek that's a treasure trove of mysteries. A new trend started, collecting keychains. As kids, we had a bike lock key and a house key, and we always had a collection of keychains. But now there's a new kind of keychain, I watched as a group of my friends are so fascinated by this Tamagotchi. It's a pet, look, I feed him and he grows. I have to clean up his messes. He lets me know when he's sad, mad, and if I forget to feed him, he'll die. I've had pets my whole life. I really liked that Tamagotchi, but it wasn't my birthday. I had real pets. My brother was quite the entrepreneur. He would take me on his side jobs. 
We washed this car. It took like an hour. We asked the customer if we were done. He pointed to a couple spots. We broke out the hose and worked four or five bucks a piece. Later, my mom takes us to the store. I see a cereal box with this Giga Pet right in front. Mom, I want this one. You don't even like this cereal, Alex. I do now. As if she didn't know I really wanted the Giga Pet inside. I get home in such a hurry to open up this box and eat dinner. In my family, you eat what's served. I really don't remember ever having a choice as to what I preferred to eat for dinner. You just ate the food that was given to you. I get home, open the box, a piece of cardboard falls out. I ravage the box. I look everywhere, frustrated. I'm looking for that gigapet. Then mom says, what's on the piece of cardboard, son? It's not what's in the picture. It's not a gigapet. She said, well, read it. Sometimes you got to read the five prints, son. Later, realizing the value of all that reading they forced down our throats in school. False advertising hit me so hard that day. I go to my mom, so disappointed, close to tears. I say, Mom, the whole reason I wanted this cereal was because there's a gigapet inside. But there's not. I don't get a gigapet, and I don't get anything I like to eat for dinner. What did the cardboard say, son? It says I have to pay for shipping and handling. Well, son, if you want the gigapet, you'll pay the three ninety-five for shipping and handling. Mom, I have five dollars. I'll give you my five dollars if you help me with this. Oh, that's more than enough, son. We'll have to go get some stamps. Six weeks had passed and all my friends had their Tamagotchis. I told my friends I was getting one. Finally, a little package came in and I had my Gigapet. I played with it all night. I brought it to school. The kids took a look at it. But one day, I just stopped caring about it. The real gift I got out of that experience was the patience I learned in waiting for what you want. Sometimes if you let a little time pass, what you really want changes. And as I got older, the things I held precious changed. I realize now there's some things that just will never change. Nowadays, people don't know what a Furby is, or they certainly don't know anything about my Teddy Rockspin. I rode around in our little Jeep we had but I stayed fascinated by the things from the past. I had amassed a collection of shark teeth and other fossils. Animals that once thrived had now succeeded to extinction, and not just the apex predators, other animals that could have been benign like those giant extinct parrotfish. I see this world in a new light every day. I put more and more pieces of this massive puzzle together, hoping one day I will solve it. At this moment, I realize that like the prisoners of Auschwitz, there's creatures in existence that are starving just like my grandfather did. I realize if we don't contribute in a meaningful way, they will be like the fossils of yesterday and hopelessly succumb to extinction. As I get older, I find out how hard it is to make time for hobbies like finding shark teeth or animals and Native American artifacts. But like I promised you a while back, I will tell you the story, to the best of my memory, of an ancient Indian artifact that we found that is now on display in the Matheson Museum. By late middle school, the price of digital cameras had come down and became affordable. We actually acquired one. From my 8th grade year through my 10th grade year, I wanted to capture photos of every native snake species here in Florida. This was the days of dial-up internet and the early days of computers in general. Computers were far less dependable back then and Facebook hasn't even been invented yet, which is a key part of the story. The first attempts at finding Indian artifacts were mostly just aimlessly digging looking for flint. Countless times we believed ordinary rocks were some precious artifact when in fact they were just chops off a preform that would have been the actual artifact. Then there was my first artifact. I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was a circle, but it was obviously worked all the way around. Looks like some precursor to currency, but only because I still can't see the function of it. But when you find your first true artifact, there's no mistaking it. It catches your eyes, and when you hold it, it's like digging up the past 
that hasn't been touched for thousands of years. It's just a different feeling knowing that the last person that touched this was probably a Native American Indian. And if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, I can't tell you how many words I said alone about this first Native American artifact I found. It just tells so many different stories like how did it get there? Who made it? What was it used for? And did it get lost in battle or was it an arrow that got broken? Who knows what it actually was? <laughs>